All right. Buon pomeriggio. Good afternoon. Welcome. Lovely to see you here. So, um, my name is Beatrice Leanza. Uh, I'm a curator and the moderator of this talk. Uh, this is, I understand, the second in a series that Salone has decided to organize this year. Uh, and my guests are three. Two are here with me. I will just mention them, but you know, we'll get to learn more of them. I'll give you an introduction about what they do and who they are. We have Anne of Jane. We have Marion van Haubel. And in connection from New York, we have Liam Young that I hope we're going to see in a second. I don't see you, Liam. Yes, I see you. There you are. So congratulations, because Liam is not with us today, unfortunately, but he's probably a little bit hangover, <laughs> because he had a big premiere last night at the Tribeca Film Festival. So you know, congrats. How are you, Liam? Uh, tired, a little worse for wear, but I'm excited to be here. <laughs> All right, we'll try to keep it dynamic, you know, so you can stay awake. Um, so let me just, you know, put a little bit in context to what we are going to do today and, and, and why I invited, you know, uh, this fantastic speaker uh, to be here with us. So we are sitting here in an installation, you know, that was developed by the architect Mario Cucinella um, that is uh, called the title Design with Nature. And the idea here is that this sort of landscape is exploring the themes of circular economy and reuse, starting with the idea that cities could be possible reserves of the future. This is a description of the piece. But so this, of course, when we tackle the future, opens an avalanche of questions. So uh, our, our cities are our only options. Uh, and who would live in them? Uh, are we going to get our proteins or vitamins, you know, like from the same sources that we do nowadays? Uh, who, what will power our world? And, you know, um, will men ominously, you know, live forever? So in this talk today, uh, our talk today is themed around the science and design of uh, world building and its connection to notions of ecological practice and environmental reparations that provide us with alternative views uh, of how we can disentangle these complexities uh, that are surrounding these topics and, the and these uncertainties um, into future-facing face imaginaries of empowering optimism certainly beyond the doom and catastrophism that often accompanies you know, topics um, around uh, future survival. So, but there is one issue, and sorry if I indulge for two minutes more, um, is that you know, if it's true that climate discourse today is galvanizing you know, youth movements, civic action, you know, uh, you know, thickening intergovernmental agendas, and all the more, um, the history of environmentalism of the past and present centuries you know, is filled really with missed chances. Um, and most gravely also of political rationalizations you know, that have long attempted to sort of uh, mitigate you know, the erosive you know, effect of anthropogenic phenomena you know, onto the world. So in this context, you know, we are um, trying to tackle the topic of climate change no more simply as an issue of, of technological prowess, you know, or te technological solutionism, but as a principled cultural predisposition that we must exercise to rethink human-centric paradigms and so human-centered designs um, to build novel vocabularies uh, of inclusion, of plurality, and of, clear, and of care. So the stories and experiences that we are going to listen to today, um, so I'm going to invite uh, every one of them, every, uh, you know, each one of our speakers to have a little introduction just to give you a sense of what they do, what's their work. Um, and then we're going to have uh, all together a conversation. Um, so we will start with Liam. Um, Liam, you can, you know, give us your little, your little intro so you can begin. Did you hear me? Liam, can you hear me? <laughs> She's Aren't moving you? around. I can, can you hear me? Sorry, I'm trying to test, I'm trying to test the Wi-Fi through the Tribeca Festival and it's not. Do you, do you want me, do you want me maybe to start, we, we'll, we'll switch the order, we can, we start with Anna while we sort the Wi-Fi. Uh, no, I'm all good. Uh, all right. I'm ready to go. Um, okay. I just, I just wanted to do a very quick introduction. Um, what I've prepared for my 10 minutes 
is a little description of the project we're premiering here at Tribeca. And apologies be with everyone in Milan, but um, it seems that in 2022 there is only one month that exists, which is June, and everyone tries to do their events in June. So we're. But, um, but we want to do Planet City, which is a project that's really a work. But at the same time, it's hopefully a useful description for the conversation about how we might mobilize world building as a practice means to help us to collectively imagine the type of futures that we might want to exist with. Um, try and frame my lectures not as PowerPoints and presentations, but the story. So the next piece is kind of a, a tour through the narrative and um, the narrative. All right, thanks, Liam. We, you were a little bit breaking off. And we, we need you to find a better <laughs> Wi-Fi spot. <laughs> but all right, I guess that we can see the video now. Yes. All cities are fictions. Their literal edges are nebulous and their physical definition is endlessly being rewritten. But in many ways, their boundaries come into focus as shared narratives. The fiction of a city can weigh as much as its physical shadow. They are lived and occupied, read and watched with consequence and meaning. I am a director and architect and I tell stories about cities, some real and some imagined. The urban imaginary has always been a site in which to prototype new scenarios and emerging cultures. In their speculative streets, we play out multiple, unexpected, unintended futures in their associated social and political ideologies. Whether it be speculation around the impacts of industrialization and mass production, the imminent arrival of driverless cars, seamless augmented reality or artificial intelligence, these fictional worlds give form to our most wondrous technological possibilities and gravest concerns. Following centuries of colonization, globalization, and never-ending economic extraction, we have remade the world from the scale of the cell to the tectonic plate. Urban development has forever changed the composition of the atmosphere, the oceans, and the earth. There is no city and country anymore, no nature or technology. Instead, we have engineered a continuous urban construct that stretches across the entirety of the earth. The dystopias of science fiction that previously read as speculative cautionary tales are now the stage sets for the everyday as we live out our lives in a disaster film that's playing in real time. In this moment without a future, as a slow motion catastrophe envelops us at a speed that makes it uncomfortable to ignore, I want to tell a story about another planet city. A counter narrative. A story about a concentrated city for the entire population of the Earth. The anti city to the sprawl we all inhabit. Seven thousand languages spoken, ninety million songs, forty two billion fruit trees, over nine hundred zettabytes of data, ninety million beehives, six million dentists, one hundred and forty eight million square kilometers of protected park, and one city. A planet city. When 
I just described is my thought experiment on a world called Planet City. An imaginary city for 10 billion people. The projected global population of 2050. I believe that by creating fictional worlds, we can connect emotionally to the ideas and challenges of our future. We've been creating Planet City in response to the rising red line on the graph of climate change. But world building and storytelling can do so much more than just visualize this data. It can be about dramatizing data. In speculative cities such as this, we can immerse ourselves in the various consequences of the decisions we face today. They can be both cautionary tales or roadmaps to an aspirational future. So I invite you to imagine that we're all standing alongside the canals of Planet City. How would it feel to be one of the 10 billion people who live here? To hear the hums and crackles the flickering blue and red LEDs that illuminate the lower reaches of the city's farm fields. It smells of soil and hard drives and sweet fruit. A purple sunrise over a new kind of wild. Five years ago, seminal biologist Edward O. Wilson proposed a new world he called Half Earth. A plan to stave off mass extinction by devoting half the surface of the earth completely to nature and consolidating human development to the other half that would remain. And this is where the speculation of Planet City begins. But as we started to design and visualize this radical reversal of our planetary sprawl, we soon realized that we could actually go much further. In its most provocative form, if we were to reorganize our world at the intensity of the densest cities that currently exist, then Planet City could actually occupy as little as 0.02% Earth. Could we imagine coming to a global consensus to retreat from our vast network of existing cities into this one hyperdense metropolis? What would it take? Our imaginary city would allow us to surrender the rest of the globe to nature, to return stolen lands and rewild in our wake. A new national park of the world to be visited and tended rather than engineered for extraction. The invisible lines that once divided us would fade beneath a planet of trees. And in the streets of Planet City, we can prototype some of the necessary lifestyle changes that will be required for us to continue to sustain human life on the planet. We can explore how such a new world could evolve, not in a singular forced move, but in a slow, multi-generational retreat from the world we once knew. To build Planet City, we will mine our old cities rather than virgin ground. No new resources would need to be consumed or extracted to build this future. The world shipping fleet that used to scatter matter ripped from the earth into our malls and storefronts could be reversed and repurposed to bring all that material back together again in the geological strata of the new city. And the ghosts of nation states would soon give way to the city's new neighborhoods that will be formed around shared cultural practices as we perform new myths of care, belonging, and recreation. If we were to map out all the world's festivals on a calendar, then we realized that running through Planet City would be a continuous festival procession, dancing across a 365-day loop. Each day, Amongst the flittering confetti, it would intersect with another carnival or culture, endlessly cycling through new colours and costumes and cacophonies. And to design the systems of Planet City, we travelled to, researched and filmed the mega-scale renewable energy and agriculture sites that already exist around the world today. 
world's largest thermal solar plant in the Mojave Desert. The illuminated indoor farm is protecting crops from harsh Siberian winters. The most productive wind energy network located in Gansu, China. The world's largest algae farm in Western Australia. These monumental infrastructures are evidence that much of the technologies required to regenerate our climate are actually already here. And in Planet City, we remove the political roadblocks or the lack of cultural investment that currently holds them back, and we visualize how they could operate at global scales. Not out on an industrial periphery, but woven to the very fabric of the city itself. And so before dawn breaks, thousands of autonomous cleaning blades will squeak along the solar fields. Waves of mirrors will ripple as they rotate to chase the changing light. A billion panels collected from all over the world. And the batteries of Planet City are alive with fish and pink algae. As excess wind and solar power pumps water through the canals to high altitude holding lakes in the city's upper floors. Power is stored here as potential energy rather than in resource-intensive lithium batteries. And tides rise and fall as the turbines spin. So, although wildly speculative, grounding imaginary worlds such as Planet City in the real science and technology of the present moment means we can begin to project ourselves into this future. Fishing in the city's battery lakes, following the seasons up through the towers to collect honey with the Planet City beekeepers, falling in love amongst the pink algae blooms before harvest. Planet City in the end is not a proposal, however. It's a provocation, a thought experiment that shows us that we don't need to trample so hard across the earth. If we can imagine these systems working at the scale of 10 billion, then the only thing standing in our way of rewiring and consolidating our existing cities is ourselves, our own biases and blind spots, politics and prejudices. In many ways, each of us has already been living in a planetary city all along. The planet city is both entirely imaginary and already here simultaneously a challenging image of a possible tomorrow and an urgent illumination of the environmental questions that are facing us today. So at the end of our wanderings, our science fiction safari through this speculative city will finally return us to where we first started, to look back on our own cities again, but with new eyes. This journey has been a call to actively visualize our possible futures. Imaginary worlds in which we can collectively shape where we all might want to go next. All right. Thank you, Liam. Sorry, it's a bit noisy in here. It's very distracting, actually. Excuse me? Yeah, well, I think that, I, I think this is, I, I wanted to ask you, actually, what did you, uh, what did you present in Tribeca yesterday? Was it a version of Planet City, a new edition? It's a, it's a, it's a screening. Okay, yeah, yeah, but yeah. I won the award, right? Oh. No, it was a uh, preview. We, okay, okay. We can't VR. hear you, Iliam, sorry. I don't know if it's on our Good. side. Our experience of Planet City and the city film. Did you hear that? I didn't hear that. Sorry, Liam, you have to say it again. <laughs> we are having problems. We can't hear you very well. It's really breaking off the connection. I'm sorry. Right. That's all right. Um, maybe we don't have... Um, uh, yeah, I do think it's really working. Well, maybe maybe someone in the you know uh, can check with the 
with that. In the meantime, though, we, we, we move along and we are going to hear from Anna Jane. Um, hello, everyone. Um, uh, maybe we, we can pull up my slides. Um, hopefully, Liam will find a more useful Wi-Fi spot. Thanks, everyone who's come here. <laughs> And we're going to have like a competition. Who can clap louder? <laughs> um, oh, there we are. Okay. Um, okay. So um, um, the title of my talk is uh, "A World of Many Worlds," um, where we are. Where I'm trying because of the theme of this work with uh, panel about world building. I'm drawing inspiration from the Zaptistas philosophy where they talk about a world where many worlds fit and that's the kind of work that I've been doing in my practice at uh, Superflux. Um, but it's not actually yeah, so uh, that's my practice. Uh, it's called Superflux. We're based in London. I run it with my partner called John Arden. Um, and our work in actually explores the conditions which make it possible to imagine other worlds. So uh, it's often referred to as speculative design, design fiction, experiential futures, critical design. Call it what you may. We think we like to call it that we design questions. So really, we are trying to poke holes at the world from many different angles and trying to show what other realities, tangential realities, could be made possible. And I'm going to share three works very quickly that give a glimpse of our work. So starting with a film, uh, the starting um, in initial um, sort of opening of a film we made. Um, I am struggling with this. Okay. Is it playing? Yeah. Can we have audio? Yeah, that was kind of like us. It was a race to capture the public interest and hold it with any subject, however trivial. taking our hopes and fears, our pain and suffering, and using it for content between ads. Everything had to be smart, hold users for as long as possible, reward them for everything while milking as much data out of them as you can. This is the opening of a film called Intersection we made last year. It's a culmination of a large scale project where we were trying to understand what do ambient technologies all around us, artificial intelligence, Internet of Things, sensors, these technologies that are seamlessly collecting data about us, what values do they embody, whom do they really serve, and sort of what do they make possible. And, but also what happened is when we were doing this project, it was the start of 2020. Um, and it was, uh, ooh, this, yeah, it was, okay, <laughs> suddenly it's working. Um, uh, it was the time when a lot happened. So 2020 changed shape, COVID, profound grief following the tragic murders of Breonna Taylor and George Floyd, um, the related protests, the swelling movement of Black Lives Matter, the fires that swept through Australia, the QAnon movement, the US elections, the unprecedented heat waves and flooding. All of that forced a reckoning with how these technologies were actually helping and influencing our political, social, economic and environmental systems. And it reminded us of something that Ashish Gadiali talks about, that understanding the roots of climate change means understanding the 500 years history of slavery, of colonialism, of neoliberal structural adjustment as part of one continuous narrative. Only by recognizing the multiple connections between these seeds of oppression can we start to create a community of care around the world. And so really, the project, the film that we created, the intersection, 
journeys from a violent present to a cooperative future. It draws connections between these multiple oppressive forces and foregrounds the need for a common shared ground to imagine better collective futures. And the story revolves around these four protagonists, all of them moving from their own personal histories into futures, you know, fighting sort of, uh, how do I say, um, design, extractive technology norms, context collapse, and a lot more. And let me just take you through one of couple of their journeys. So Tammy is a young climate migrant who becomes a refugee in her own country because her family refused to evacuate in the face of impending storm citing fake news reports. And this entire film is based in the US, just for context. I remember the wind woke me up and I could tell something was wrong right away. I remember my parents laughing and yelling fake news at the TV in the days leading up to it. They didn't believe nothing unless they read it from people they knew online in just their private groups all locked away and exclusive just like the village. When that big storm rolled in off the gulf, when that water was on our doorstep, nothing was keeping it out, we had no chance. We lost everything. But I'll never forget the smell of the water running through the house and our neighbors crying for help. The other, uh, one of the other protagonists is Erica, a veteran activist who's movement for justice is derailed by a never-ending feed of misinformation and conspiracies con con connected to extract data. Soon people started turning up and joining us with their own agendas, demanding that the government stop drinking children's blood, saying that the cops were really lizard people, infighting within our own ranks over which conspiracy theory was true. Mobs setting fire to cell towers, um, so and there are four other protagonists, but really at the end of it, what our film, the request for our film was create a film about hope. But where is hope in this world? And for us, the coming together and to find a shared ground was, was a radical act of hope. And we could only start imagining what happens after if we can do that. Um, I recommend that all of you go on YouTube and look at the full film on the Superflux YouTube channel. Um, I want to highlight very quickly some of the key pro objects we made. We are, in a, we are in a furniture fair. We are in a world of looking at designed objects. Well, these are slightly different. They are exploring a different relationship with technology, non-extractive, distributed, and regenerative. Um, we, cr we created these objects and crafted them from materials that would be available once mass production facilities no longer exist. And we're calling this period the craftocene, which is designing tools from the detritus or the waste of the Anthropocene. Um, some of the other objects are these kind of environmental servers, a sensor network monitor that measures data, but again, handcrafted and created in what we call the craftocene. One of the most important things that emerged from this project was the need for mutualism, the need for solid, human solidarity. And I want to draw attention to that idea that this, this kind of need for a shared common ground must be extended to other species. And a lot of our work in the last few years is looking at the idea of the more than human. So to acknowledge that we are part of a larger ecology, we are not masters of nature. Um, and to that effect, um, I had written um, a kind of a field guide for a more than human politics uh, in 2019. And so this is the kind of perspective in inviting people to shift from a more human to a more than human perspective, to shift from this idea of let's fix things, to start to care for things, from moving around innovation where we're constantly adding to resurgence, where we are restoring and renewing. Um, and a project that kind of amplifies that idea is, a, is, is this installation called Refuge for Resurgence, which we showed at the Venice Biennale last year, is now at the Barbican in London. This is a multi-species banquet, so we invite 14 different species to come and dine with humans at the same table. So alongside um, a human man, woman, and a child, you have a rat, and a wasp, and a snake, and a boar, and a mushroom, and a pigeon, and a raven. And the idea is that at creatures and species that we once considered to be pests or vermins, well, they've claimed their rightful place in this new ecological sort of world order, if you like. Um, 
And these are just some examples of the kind of place settings um, we created. So I just want to kind of read about uh, one of them. So this is a ceremonial cutlery, which is species specific. This one honors the wild boar's role as a patron of seed dispersal and resilience in changing conditions. Um, this one is a wasp. It's the wasps. Honey dipper and feather brush are constructed using jewelry making processes and made of brass, cotton twine and a guinea fowl feather that delicately collects insects, living and carcasses as offerings for the wasps larvae. And you see this journey from the fox to the mushroom, which is a journey from patriarchy to matriarchy, from extraction to resurgence, from fear to hope. And this is a view outside of this table of this deconstructed home, which gives you a sense of this kind of rewilded landscape. Um, and just a kind of a fact that we also wrote a poem and a soundscape uh, for this. Our forms changing in unison with one another, in unison with the changing climate and drifting continent. The dance of life, ebbing and flowing across time. And very, very finally, this last glimpse of a project called the library that we made uh, for the Museum of the Future in Dubai, again building on these themes of more than human perspectives. This is this kind of enormous interactive installation at the Museum of the Future in Dubai. <laughs> It catalogues the wonderful diversity of our planet's living things, inviting visitors to form a deeper connection with nature. It, it, it sort of reveals the interconnected nature of all the different species. There are about 2,400 crystal jars suspended in this 365 square meter space. It's not just a beautiful representation of the glorious sweep of life on Earth, but a continuously evolving laboratory. Visitors can use a handheld device and, you know, go up and learn about each specimen and find how it connects to our past but also future ecologies. And this is set in 2071. Um, and I'm going to end over there. Um, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Anna. Incredible. That's really the one that I am... I'm, I'm I'm really missing. I need to make a trip to that to that place because it just opened, right? The Museum yeah. of the Future opened earlier this year. Yes. So, yeah. yeah. Well, if you you know want to do a combo, go see the the expo. <laughs> Actually, could catch both of you know like both of your works. Uh, so we'll find out from Marion very soon. Uh, so I'll let I'll give you the stage, Marion. Yeah. So. Yes. Hello, my name is Seth. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me, Beatrice. It's a Pleasure to be here. Yeah, so my name is uh, Marianne van Aubel. I call myself a solar designer. Um, and I started calling myself a solar designer when I learned about the fact that every hour we receive enough sunlight to provide the whole world with enough electricity for an entire year. I mean, can you imagine this fact? It's just crazy. We're getting this constant energy and then solar panels look like this, this, pa this panel. This is actually a picture of uh, a rooftop in New York in 1884. Think about this. And they still look like this today. So I would say this technology, which is like put on roofs, is, can save our world. And it's just being like kind of like put into a into building and not like really integrated. So what do we need to do? And what do we need to do that we don't fill our landscapes like this? That we kind of like, uh, yeah, live in harmony with nature and not kind of like just put this really little technology on on our environment, but really make it part of our environment and, yeah, use solar design. And I think we can go uh, two things. So, what kind of action do we need to do now that in hundred years of t time? We look back at solar as something we're proud of, instead of something like, okay, that's what we need to do now, and it saved us, but we need to be, make better solutions and, and think a bit further than just putting it on. So I think there are two ways of doing that. I'm Dutch, I'm from the Netherlands, and we all know this image, and like hundreds of tourists come in buses to see these things, and it's a way of harvesting energy from wind. And um, 
what do we need to do that we go to these solar parks or things that, and, and we look at solar panels like this. So either one we make it to a statement, something like a monument, or we make it invisible, like uh, Elon Musk is doing, for example, so that it becomes like naturalized, it becomes so part of our environment that we don't experience it as a technology, like our handwriting, our clothing, for example. That's old technology, but it's so intertwined to, into our daily life. I'm going to quickly show you some examples of my work, um, because this is what we've, I've shown here is at the fair also once. It's a collaboration with Swarovski, and here the idea was to really combine aesthetics and efficiency. Because if you cut crystals in a certain way, you're able to bend and uh, direct the light onto a certain space. So you can make solar panels more efficient. So basically you can take these solar crystals, put them in a docking station, and they would uh, power these um, uh, chan yeah, Swarovski chandeliers. So it's a way to making solar mobile, for example. Another example is current table, where the whole tabletop consists out of colored solar cells that work indoors. So basically, the, um, yeah, you can pl plug your device into the table. There are orange uh, cells, for example, because they, uh, they are more efficient in the, in the house and they don't need direct sunlight. You can even put it in the shade, which I didn't know before I was started working with this technology. So you can plug your devices and basically a table is working for you. It becomes like a surface and you have to take care of it a bit, like a plant. You don't, you know, if you put all the stuff on it, it doesn't work. So you form a relationship with it. The more surface you have, the more energy you can harvest. These are uh, current windows, um, which we integrated in uh, Seoul, uh, in uh, Greek streets. And people from the street could come and charge their phones. So it's a way of really adding extra functions to an object. A window can also be become a power station. This is uh, the example from Dubai. And um, this is uh, the Dutch pavilion. In, um, and this, uh, I worked together with uh, V8 Architects. And it's a completely yeah, circular building. It's, a, 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 it's called the Dutch biotape, where uh, food, water, and energy are combined. So there's uh, water being made from the air, and uh, that's kind of giving like water to the plants and stuff. Uh, plants are being grown to this water and being powered by the roof. And I'm going to show you a short clip to get a bit of an idea of this pavilion. The sun is for everyone. Every day it provides us with an abundance of natural energy. But how can we use this incredible energy source more than we do? For the Netherlands Pavilion in Dubai, Marjan van Abel's studio has created a new solar experience using the solar panels of the future. The solar roof is made from lightweight, transparent solar cells produced with a limited environmental footprint. The colored organic photovoltaic film by Aska is made of solar cells printed on thin foils. The solar roof not only provides power for the pavilion, it also allows the right spectrum of sunlight through for the plants. You will see solar design in a whole new light as the colored solar roof bathes the pavilion in rays of color. Solar can be beautiful and create a whole new visual experience for everyone while collecting energy. Make beauty even more powerful. Yeah, so it's really nice to like be in this pavilion and kind of like becomes like a sort of like church feeling so that you really can like see the colors of the of the solar panels on your skin and um let's see if i have a picture of that yeah so it's really like you, you ex really experience this like how energy can be beautiful as well and what i really liked about the pavilion is that it's um, a circular building and that was one of the only pavilions that is not there anymore. So all the materials went back to its original state. So now uh, you've see, um, sort of the, the metal is being used to build bridges again. And we, the solar panels get also a different function. So yeah, the, the pavilion is, is gone now, which is uh, pretty incredible. Um, and it's yeah, what I kind of like liked about this technology that it's, yeah, you can create patterns and um, uh, yeah, kind of like a new s sort of solar feel. And um, but the, 
it was so high up, it was 20 meters high, so I thought it was a bit of a, yeah, of a shame that you couldn't see it from close by. So we created uh, Ra, which is named after the yeah, god, the Greek god of uh, the sun, and uh, to create kind of like a sort of self-illuminated artwork. So you hang this in front of your window, and it has like a sort of very light, thin uh, LED paper strip to um, so that we charge yourself. So you can really sort of see the sort of the colors and the patterns and the moire effects from close by. So you can see it again. It's like a, yeah. So so I'm kind of like hoping to see that we could see every surface or object kind of as a sort of an opportunity to harvest energy. And I hope in the future we will consider an ob yeah, a building or object to be broken if it doesn't generate its own energy. This is uh, the last project I'm going to talk about. It's called uh, Sana, which is um, yeah, self-powering uh, light. And I know when, when I was at the beach and I saw the sun going down and I this this magical moment, I kind of want to extend. And uh, this is what's happening in, in Sana. So one, t one uh, uh, side is solar and the other side is a solar panel. So you hang it in front of the window and during the day it's kind of like collects sunlight and in the evening it kind of like, yeah, it mimics the sun, uh, the sunset. It has that three uh, different settings. This is sunrise, sunlight and sunset. Yeah, we work together with, uh, because more normally solar cells are being uh, made for like outdoor use, but we, so we work together with uh, TNO, which is the Energy Research Center of the Netherlands, to create solar cells that, yeah, do, they also work under like different light conditions, because we don't know where people will hang their light, for example, so we don't know about their glass or is there a tree, so it has to be quite like sensitive to different light conditions. Yeah, and, uh, last year we did a, a Kickstarter with this. We started as an with an idea, and um, yeah, luckily that went really well. And uh, for, so for the first time for me, this is like a product actually that can like uh, make on a larger scale. So people can uh, yeah buy this thing now. Because first my work was mostly in museums and as on exhibitions, but yeah, I kind of aiming for solar democracy that we see solar energy everywhere for everyone. So we need to start thinking of like how our surrounding can be self-powering. What do we need? This is the first example, but I wish we start looking differently at uh, how and where we get our energy from, because we can actually get it here on the spot. I actually saw that h here in this building, there are a lot of solar panels. So that's good. The, the, the fair has a lot of solar panels. I always check where I, wherever I go to see do they have solar panels? I don't know why. Um, There's the last thing I um, maybe would like to talk about. It's uh, because we're here at the design fair, but I think in, term to, uh, to, in terms of talking about solar, it needs a different approach because we need to bring architects, uh, designers, people that work in policy, people that are thinking about our environment together to think how can we speed this up and how can we change this narrative around solar energy from something that is not only technical, but becomes part of our environment and we want to be surrounded with part of our culture. So we're hosting the first solar biennial in September in the Netherlands. Um, we're starting in Rotterdam. It's a six week program and we end in uh, the Dutch design week with a pavilion. So all welcome there. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Marianne. So I think I think that Liam has sort of lost in that in that uh, you know hyper zone. So yeah. we'll, we'll we'll continue if or, oh, or we found it. We got him back. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in bits and pieces. Let's see if this let's see if this works. You can hear you can hear us, yeah, Liam. Yeah, I can be fine. Oh, okay, great. Are you on the roof? I'm, I'm on, on the, the street, street in New York. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. Okay, this is perfect, right? I mean, so, all right, let's, let's, you know, like, let's walk back. So the reason why I, I, you know, I really invited you guys, because I think um, 
that you all have this amazing capacity, you know, like to operate within design uh, and but being influenced and influencing, you know, like so many aspects of what it means to practice design today. I know that neither of you, Leah, um, and you like to get the tag of being either a critical designer or, or else. Um, but effectively, you know, you operate within that realm in a very specific way and one that you're championing, you know, egregiously. So, Liam, there's one thing that in, there is in your book, actually, your Planet City book. So, the, we failed to mention that, that actually this beautiful piece comes with a thick book with contributions by a lot of incredible people. But in that book, you mentioned something that says climate change is no longer a technological problem, but rather an ideological one rooted in culture and politics. So maybe you, we can start from there and, and how it connects to Planet City and what, you know, the vision that you had. Yeah, yeah unlike, unlike a lot of, of um, contemporary science fiction, fiction, we didn't, didn't invent, invent any new technology, technology to make Planet City. City. Actually, the city is formed and shaped by technologies that, in every case, are already here. In a lot of cases, they actually have been here for 10 or 15 years. Things like renewable energy, solar, wind, these aren't new. We kind of have all the technologies required to dig us out of the hole that we've created for ourselves. It's this. But really, it's political lobbies and cultural prejudice and bias that keep you down. What, what, what Planet City, City is doing is trying to visualize what would happen or what could happen if we roll these technologies out at planetary scale and fully embrace their possibilities. And that's what I'm trying to, I guess, get across from that, that notion of climate change is no longer a technological problem, that, that really it's about uh, not sitting around waiting for months to develop a new hyperloop or another electric car or a ship to Mars. We just need to um, get ourselves together and figure out what kind of future we want to live in. If we don't want to go extinct, then we need to start to roll out a lot of these systems that are hiding in plain sight. Yeah, so it's because I also think that there are another common trait here is that while you are all, and perhaps you, Anup, as well, of course, you double a little bit in this very... Um, uh, you know, powerful way of kind of like shocking, you know, our imagination, but through kind of realistic, uh, you know, simulations, let's call them. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I guess is really common here uh, is that we are not sort of dichotomizing the utopia versus dystopia, you know, uh, imaginary. So there is, um, I would like, uh, maybe you, Liam, and then also you, uh, Anna, you can respond to this, is like the way you actually come to create this, you know, like these worlds. There's a lot of collaboration and exactitude coming to it. So, Liam, how did, when did you know you had Planet City, you know, in your, in your mind, right, in your vision? Because this is like the, the power of what you have done with it, right? There is a convincing world, you know, that we can inhabit with our minds, our eyes, our bodies. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, think the, the idea, idea, and I'm uh, sure I've shared this sentiment, is that, I mean, our projects are, uh, uh, we work for deep collaboration, they're clever scientists and technologists, and we begin really our, our, our speculative work with a deep engagement in the present and the technologies of the present, and really we work for a, for a process of exaggeration and extrapolation. And we do so because we feel like the most powerful speculations are one that, the ones that feel visceral because they're grounded in context that's believable. You know, that, that, that distinguishes our work from works of fantasy. You know, we do, do sci-fi, yes, but we don't do starry spaceships, stars and laser beams. We don't do, yeah, you know, Game of Thrones, dragon shit. We, we try and create work that is immediate and it is impossible to ignore because you can kind of project yourself in it as opposed to escaping into the picture. And I think the collaboration is really supported in ground out work. Yeah, no, I, I really couldn't agree more to what Liam said. Um, I want to say something about the collaboration as well because we collaborate a lot with scientists and stuff. Then what is becoming clear is that data is not cutting it. We have all the data, we have all the numbers to show us that we are heading towards the sixth extinction. 
and we also have all the data and evidence to say what we could do otherwise. And yet, we are not able to swing decisions. So our current tools, rational, scientific, database tools, are not doing the job. And yet, we continuously stick to those tools. So I suppose what, what we are doing uh, in, in different yet adjacent ways is saying, let's explore other tools. Let's explore the tools of our imagination. Let's speculate. Because the data is only what has been, not what could be. So let's explore what could be, and let's step into those possible worlds to see what it might feel like to live in these worlds. And, and I want to make a point about climate change in the sense that climate change is not a problem we are going to be able to solve. We have to accept that it's a predicament. It's urgently, we urgently need to respond to it, but that urgency must come with an acknowledgement that let's say what we have, let's not live in this kind of muskish disillusionment that we are going to be able to have technology that will, with a swipe of a hand, wishful thinking, solve this problem. So I think we need tools of imagination and tools of speculation and tools that are experiential to take us to other places which could, where we could thrive, really. So that's the kind of work that needs to be done, I think. Yeah. And I mean, in a way, in a way, it's also like I think, well, important, you know, to to add on is that you all also practice differently in a sense that you have um, you work for you know variety of like companies, you yeah. know, like uh, mm -hmm. so corporate sector, public sector mm -hmm. um, pieces that are collected by museum and etc. So um, how do you? I mean, is this a relevant uh, element for your yes. practices? Like, yes. Leah, it's also to you, and then I, I wanted to ask you another question as well, uh, Marian, but how is this relevant? Like, or is this deliberate? So do you think you achieve different things, you know, like, uh, or working for different type of clients helps you to rehearse, test, you know, things differently? I think completely. I think if you want to create change, you need to operate in it. And I, we really go by that philosophy. So we, we literally, let me say, we are poking holes at the world. We are entering corporate spaces, government spaces, public institutions, getting everyone who wants to listen that there is another way of doing things. There's a possibility. Some people take it and embed it into their corporate processes. We have had a lot of success with this work within IKEA, for instance, over the last two years. But some places will just park it and not want to do something about it. But we, ha we have to, we cannot just continue to do the work we're doing in isolation. We have to go and intervene and infiltrate and use all available tools. I think it's urgent, so it's, yeah. Liam? Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm um, an architect, and an architect is generally really good at talking to other architects <laughs> and screaming into the echo chamber. And I'm aware we're talking here at the design fair. Um, this is another kind of echo chamber. But essentially, my work generally, and the reason I'm here and, and I'm based in LA, is that what we try and do is encode these critical ideas that we're talking about into the medium of popular culture. Like, I really couldn't give a shit about a design book in an art bookstore or, you know, showing a new chair at the picker or something like that. Like, it, for us, it's really about trying to use mediums that don't just reach design audiences, but reach public audiences in the, in the scales of millions. You know, like, when we, when we do visual consulting for a Hollywood film, we're doing it um, because there's the opportunity to engage the sorts of people that don't turn up at an event like this. Yeah. And I think that if, as architects and designers, we truly value the ideas that we talk about, is our responsibility to find forums and formats for our project work that move outside of our usual audiences and connect to other kinds of people. Totally, yes. I mean, so I think, it, I, to me, like this a little bit resonates also in your work, right, uh, Marians? Especially, I love that you talk about solar democracy. I mean, this is such a beautiful expression. How do you see that then? How does this work in your work, balancing, you know, the, the outputs? Yeah, I mean, like, yeah, solar democracy is really like, energy is like, I mean, we can actually feel and see it now. That's, we're so, it's like, or like maybe it should be a currency even. It's like something, it should be shared more and stuff and not something that 
co couple of companies are digging down from the ground, but we it can be so more dem the, uh, democratic if we have like this constant source that we can basically share and one neighborhood is kind of like um, uh, collecting more than the other so it can it can be so more collaborative and if you work for example with natural intelligence you can kind of see oh there that's a part of the world has more sun so let's concentrate on that there so they're like technology can also help us to be more in tune with nature and use the energy we, we get from the sun it's not only about the energy but also like how we use our materials for example um, yeah, like I said it's like becoming at this fair is like kind of made me a bit also sad that we're still doing the same thing and still yeah, using the same materials to show th things and it's changes so slow in, the, in a way and I was hoping after the pandemic we would also change the way we we, we do something like this yeah, and also, um, I mean, I think that's, and, and, and I hope that, you know, having put this a little bit together, you know, like there would be, you know, interest in, in digging more into what all of you do. I mean, of course, no, it's not that a half an hour conversation will, you know, help us, you know, like uh, go in such depth. But um, there's something I really like uh, in, in um, uh, that you mentioned once in an, in a, um, uh, in an interview, Anna, but I think, uh, and it was about a shifting language, you know, so how do we have to... The, how we really need to invest into building new vocabularies. Uh, I think a lot of what Planet City kind of tries to say, of course, is building exactly this kind of different syntax, you know, like in words to which we attach value. Um, and in, you, you are speaking about your more than human manifesto, um, Anna. Um, so maybe you can tell us a little bit of that, but make a couple of examples of words that you're using there, like. I really love this idea of shifting from system to assemblages, uh, assemblages and from, of course, in independence, independence to interdependence. Yeah, I, I, I think that uh, we are so used to, like, you know, innovation, innovation, innovation. Let's, let's, let's innovate, let's, you know, disrupt. And I think we need to kind of find new, new we don't need to find, I think we already have new vocabularies, and I think we need to reclaim them. And, and, and I think in that sense, that was really the work that, you know, when we talk of systems, we assume we have this kind of God's eye on things that are happening and we can view a system and we can tweak and change it, whilst actually we are completely and 100% entangled with everything in this world. We are not separate from it. So the framing of assemblages is saying, we are here, we can see the nodes and networks and we start connecting and forming this. And that, in a sense, takes us from this independent systems view to an interdependent, connected and entangled view. And you know, if you talk to any quantum physicist, they'll say the same thing. There is no such thing as the individual view. We are all entangled without each other, without the microbes, without the lichen, without the wolf. We do not exist. So in a way, how do we infiltrate this thinking into everything we do so that we stop, kind of right from the time we are born, we stop kind of boxing education, siloing things, compartmentalizing things, because then it's easy for those who are governing us to have a clarity of view. Let's confuse those who are in power as much as possible. And I think the best tool, the most dangerous tool to confuse people and those in power is imagination. Sure. Yeah. And I, I wonder if, if for you, Marian, is a little bit, uh, there is a similar ethos in having organized this, uh, aside of the Biennale, the Biennale of course is an important manifestation that brings people together, but you speak also of a solar movement. So tell us a little bit more of the motivation behind this. I mean, how, wh why getting involved in that? Yeah, 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 because exactly what you said, it's like we as a designer talking about this subject, then you have the, the scientists, the, the, the industry and stuff. So. Um, I met Pauline van Dongen, she's a fashion designer and she integrates uh, solar into clothing. Mm -hmm. Basically, I was like, wow, you kind of like can yourself transform yourself into a walking solar panel. It's like, mm -hmm. like such a like different approach because then you have to like kind of know I need to... And you could photosynthesize. Yeah, yeah, you can like <laughs> and you need to be in the sun for a certain amount of time. It's like really changing your even your day already. But And we didn't know each other. I mean, I know knew her work, but I was like, wow, we all not talking to each other and this topic is needs collaboration and not only talking we need to work together are we if we're going to put this like solar fields in the 
on these landscapes. It's going to affect ecology. It's going to mm -hmm. do so much to this. So we need to talk to ecologists together with people that f make them. Can we make solar panels circular, for example? That's kind of a new thing. But why are we talking together? So we brought this group together that were like kind of like really forward thinkers in, the, in their fields. We brought them together and said, how can we, what do we need to do together to change this? What do we need to do to yeah, make solar panels not the asbestos of the 21st century? And um, it was, again, imagination. It's, everyone said the same thing. We need imagination to change things. We need design even and art and like it should be part of our culture. So this narrative of like efficiency, payback time, that's mm. what we talk about needs to be changed. You don't talk, if you buy a car or whatever, no one asks you, what's your payback time? Who, who cares, you know? It's like, if you buy an artwork, it is about the connection you have with it. It's about the feeling, and that is what we need to add. And it needs to be, yeah, you want to be associated with this, and it, yeah. yeah. So it's a tangibility also to kind of like getting people, of course, in, mm. in, in engaged with, you know, like this. Yeah. And um, Liam, we didn't hear you actually earlier. <laughs> When I asked you about what what, edition, what what did you show in Tribeca? Uh, we have the Planet City film is premiering along with the Planet City VR experience. What, what's happening with the VR experience? Uh, we, we hear the voice of a young child activist um, narrating the creation story of the movie. And I guess the idea is to try and talk about the idea that the nation states and issues that currently exist have done nothing significant in response to climate change. Perhaps both of the voices in this context are you know, young child activists that have been forced to, to take on the conversation because they're pretty annoyed that we've stolen their pictures away from them. So we're trying to, we're hearing from, from that perspective and that voice as in the VR experience, the city grows around you while you hear uh, an activist that becomes the first citizen of the city talk about their journey and creating the process. So they arrive by boat, they drop anchor, and they send a message out to the world uh, for people to come join them. And across multiple generations, the city grows around you in the VR experience. But it's so, I mean, I've had, of course, you know, we have before worked together, we've showed a mat, we showed Planet City. I've had, you know, the pleasure of actually seeing the full, uh, the full story, which is incredible. Please, you know, make your way to the next uh, yeah, museum or wherever, wherever else Planet City is going to be shown. Um, but I wonder, you know, what is your, what's your, what's the feedback that you got from, you know, these different ways of, you know, ev evolve the story because, for well, n for those that haven't seen it, of course, like the, the the story of Planet City is really filled with quite precise and exact details. So, uh, and when you know you get you read the book, you know you realize there are so many aspects to it. It's like, what about you know legal frameworks, right? What about you know? Um, social life. So the, one of the premise of Planet City is that this is a consensual retreat, right? We Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, yeah, it's not, um, we, we, it, we don't go there at gunpoint, but rather it emerges out of a rather optimistic global consensus. I mean, it, it, it follows on from things like the, the Global Women's March, the Global Climate Strike, yeah. The, the precedence the support on that city where we see what is literally the, the largest organization of humans ever in our history, which has been mobilized not through top-down coordinators, but through a ground-up network facilitated across the network. And co-opting that network, which can also be used to spread misinformation about vaccines um, and to elect an American idiot. Um, but it can also be used to connect people at scales that might have the possibility of dealing with something as seismic as climate change. So we, had, we have just the last five minutes. I would like you to each tell us a little bit, just to, you know, as a sort of conclusion and a hopeful look into the future, which is talking about the next generations. Um, what do you do? Because all of you have this in experience, you all teach maybe Liam first and then Anna and then Marion. Um, what do you do 
uh, at SciArc. What happens there? Because <laughs> this gets much of fun. Uh, yeah, at SciArc I run a postgraduate master's program, which is, I mean, it's called the Master's of Fiction Entertainment. Really, it's a master's program in world building. So we bring in students from all kinds of backgrounds, philosophers, writers, designers, architects, uh, filmmakers, production designers, and we come together to, to build imaginary worlds that are somehow a new form of examining the, the contemporary moment. You know, we, we really believe in the power of fiction and storytelling as the most extraordinary shared language. You know, fiction is how we share and disseminate ideas. And what we're trying to do at SciArc is create stories that uh, like Trojan horses becoming coded with all of these ideas that we're talking about and then launch them into the world with enough force that they find traction. Um, so we you know, end up graduating students who go on to become directors, uh, production designers, they work in video game, they uh, work in advertising, they work in planning and politics, um, and design research. It's really about when we talk about collaboration to start with, it's, it's not about bringing collaborators into our world, but rather it's about us infiltrating other people's spaces and trying to um, spread the sorts of methodologies that is designed to think are really valuable. Super, yeah, I like that. Spreading out into you know other people's territory. <laughs> That's right. Um, what about you? Um, yeah, so I have a professorship at University of Applied Arts at the Angevante in Vienna, and the program I run is called Design Investigations. It's an undergraduate five-year program, uh, histories and origins of industrial design. Uh, it's now, you could call it a post-industrial design program, so students are looking at not just making objects, but their implications and consequences of living with these things in society. So we, ha we, we, t we look at topics like democracy and food, Anthropocene, salvage, politics, climate change, of course. And uh, each semester, students kind of get stuck in. We have guests and experts and workshops and all of that. And after five years, they graduate like a equi master's equivalent degree um, and go and again, yeah, infiltrate the world with new ideas. You know, it's a bit of speculative design, bit of world building, bit of industrial design, very multidisciplinary. Yeah. Great. But this, which is, you know, fairly, I mean, like new in terms of, right, finding its yeah. own way. Absolutely. It's a new, yeah, it's a new, it's a new issue. Like, you know, it has a long history. Ron Arad was one of the initial starters. Fiona Raby used to run the course before me. So it has a long history. And I'm trying to kind of shape it for the world that graduates will find themselves in 5, 10, 15, 20 years. What are the worlds they are going to shape and what influence will they have rather than trying to fit into existing jobs? How can we help them create jobs that will actually make sense for the world they will graduate in? So very important. Maybe we should get a solar department somewhere then. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. No? <laughs> that would be a good one. You wanted to say something, sorry, Maria. Yeah, no, I'm just like, thinking, what, um, continue on your story. That, yeah. Uh, yeah, I used to teach at a design academy in Eindhoven. But yeah, what I would uh, taught my students is like this kind of cathedral thinking, sort of like we are going to build this future and not only for like the next 20, 10 years, but really 100 years. How would we live, like how will we build for the future that we maybe not going to experience ourselves or are like um, even our grand grandchildren not, yeah. but like we need to think ahead. And even if you think, if you design an object, think about what happens if, you, if it's been sold. You have to be circular, you have to think about the whole system. It's a big qu uh, com yeah, question and it's very complicated, but it's the way we have to think because, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Mabene, guys, thank you so much <laughs> you. for being here. I'll, I'll wait to see you, Liam, in real life, uh, you know, <laughs> at some point uh, soon, I hope. <laughs> One day. We have tried for three years now or more. But anyway, thank you so much. Anyway, enjoy the celebration, you out there today. <laughs> and thank you again. Thank this you. is thank you. very super thank nice. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you all. Thanks. Ciao, <laughs> Liam.